Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Washington, D.C., aboard one of the coolest ships in the world, the Drachen Harald Horfrage, uh, which is uh, a uh, Viking longship that was built uh, in Norway with traditional techniques and craftsmanship. If anybody knows history, they know that the Vikings were among the greatest seafarers in history, and these ships were among the greatest warships in history, the most influential, whether for trade or for war fighting. And since we like to visit modern warships, I think it's amazing to be able to actually be on the deck of a vessel that hasn't been really recreated in probably more than 1,200 years. And we're here, and it's an honor to talk to Captain Bjorn Allander, uh, Bjorn Allander, who is uh, the captain of the ship. Sir, how does it feel to be uh, in charge of one of the most amazing ships in the world? It's fantastic. I mean, we was able to come into uh, DC here without uh, US Navy detectors. So it must be a very, very uh, good uh, uh, warship. Yeah. Exactly, uh, but really, it's amazing. And you know, we were talking a little bit earlier that that uh, you know now you get such a warm welcome wherever you go. Uh, this is the second tour of the United States. The first one was in 2016. But anytime people saw the Dragon ships, it wasn't always a sort of a welcome sign, was it? No, they uh, we, we get scared. You know, when 15 p 15 ships like this coming in, they better run. But nowadays we are a little bit nicer, a little bit. But <laughs> watch yourself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, don't don't scratch too hard. The inner Viking could always uh, always come out. Um, talk to us a little bit about this extraordinary project uh, because it started with um, a, a lot of research, a lot of work, a lot of learning to be able to uh, run a ship like this because there were no books left. So you had to piece this together from sagas and from uh, the Viking Ship Museum and other museums around the world. Talk to us a little bit about the project and what it's trying to achieve, and then the process of actually designing and building such an extraordinary ship. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge project. And uh, after research, we spent two years to building the ship with eight of the best boat builders in, in uh, Norway. And you know, they had the, the, they still keep up with the tradition. So uh, how to, to um, do this, uh, assembly in this hull, they, they knew, but the size and all the rest was impressing and very hard. So we had long, long test period and also to prove to the authorities that it's working and that was hard. Uh, that's right, because safety authorities required you to have engines, for example, on the ship. And I, and and can you operate unescorted, or or has, does the Norwegian certificate require you to be escorted, especially on long voyages? Yeah, in in southern parts, but not now. We have proved that we we are seaworthy and we can make it, and we got the exemption from watertight bulkheads and things like that. It's not needed because it's open. Everything comes over the side we have to pump out. But we approved it's a very, very efficient ship and she don't take much over her and we have ride we have gone through several storms without anything uh, really happens without except from repairing sails and things like that. But that's no that's normal. And uh, it, now talk to us about how this ship differs when people think of a long ship, actually, there were a variety of different ships for different purposes, and they were judged by or, the number of oars. Talk to us about how this compares to what may have existed in, in 800 or 900, for example, in the peak of the Viking era. Yeah, this is a Viking long ship, so it's made for, for war, uh, but they also have cargo ships who was a little bit shorter and wider and, and so on, and smaller ships for, for going up on the river in Russia down to Black Sea and so on. But this was a warship for, for the first king of Norway, uh, King Harald. 
and that's why it's Drakon Harald Hor Fogre. Okay, yeah. I, I'm glad I didn't I didn't mess that up, uh, especially under your watchful eye. Uh, how many? Um, you know, I mean, it's amazing though because you're doing it. Even though the construction of the ship is still very, very traditional, you still have two uh, John Deere engines. You have a full navigation suite. Uh, they were doing it with sunstones and, and knowledge of, of the sea. How many people would have been on a ship like this? What kind of provisions would have been on it? How long would have been their voyages? I mean, we know that they made it to North America for, for sure. Uh, and, and there's still a lot of archaeological research to see how much farther they went from that uh, tip of Canada where, where, they, where they landed. But talk to us about the difference uh, on, on what this ship would have been like, for example, if we go back 1,200 years. Yeah, it's probably much more people on board. We are 34 now, and that's what we had to be because it's very, very hard work to sail. But they did other things also in harbor, so, so there was more. And um, they, they, keep it, uh, they keep water, of course, on board and dry food and things like that. But it was very primitive and they was probably very hungry when they come in ashore. <laughs> That's, that's probably why they went, uh, a, a be, you, know, you, you would be a little more ferocious to try to get off of it and get whatever's on the shore uh, when, when, when you arrive. But there would have been about 100 people aboard the yes. ship in, in Viking times? Yes. We, we have oars, we have 50 oars, and we have two men on each oar. So we have been rowing with 100 people on board, and it works perfectly. And, and how fast are you? Uh, because I mean, it's a unique rig, right? It's one gigantic sail, which is about 3,200 square feet, which is which is enormous. Um, but when you were rowing, how fast would you get? And then how fast can you get on on sail? Uh, rowing like two, three knots. If I whip them, we can go a little bit faster. And uh, she is very fast by sailing. And many people think that she can don't can go uh, close hauled, but she can. She is very, very fast, and uh, we have uh, reached 14 knots. And uh, in storm, we have uh, laying like 11 knots in average, and that's very fast uh, for a, for a, a displacement ship, a tall ship. And when later on, when we sit in the bars, we have uh, make twice that speed, of course. <laughs> that's right. But I mean, it's but if you think about it. I mean, that is uh, a modern, uh, even advanced small sailboat. You know, I'm a, I'm a sailor. If you get seven or eight knots out of your boat, that's quite an achievement. Yeah. If you're looking at a ship like this with transatlantic, transocean capability, that's yeah. really incredible. Yeah, it's, it's she is incredibly fast. And when a, a guts comes, normally uh, uh, other ships I've been on, they heal over a lot. And, uh, but this just speed up and uh, it's the shape of the, the hull and also that she is quite, uh, the beam is quite big. So she is a, f a fascinating ship, completely different from all the other ships I have been sailing in my life. Uh, and you are, you are a lifelong sailor. Uh, but let me ask you one thing. How close can she sail to the wind? Because you have one gigantic sail, which you have to m manage, right? You don't have a, a jib or anything up forward that, that can help you. So how close can you sail to the wind? And what are some tips and techniques that you've learned, despite the fact you've sailed so many things in your life, that are very, very unique about how she sails? Yeah, uh, we can go high. And that, of course, depends on the speed and, uh, and uh, the sea condition. If you, you have flat water and, and uh, good speed, we can make 50, easily 50 degrees. And that is very high. And um, yeah, uh, today do attack. It's very, very uh, special on this. We go up against the wind, the sails start to back, and we keep it backing, and she start to run backwards in the same speed as forward, you know? <laughs> and it's scaring for other ships around. And uh, she make a, a turn backwards, and then we, we, we brace over the yard and shoot it on the next side and she start to run again. Wow. And, and that's totally different from other ships. And it took us uh, quite a while to learn these techniques. So 2013 we was for 
for several months tacking and, and working with this to learn this. And I have been on Square Rigger since 1969. So this is special actually. And, and how long does that tack take, right? I mean, we get very, very used to on a modern, especially a Marconi rig, where it's very, very easy and you pull everything over and all you have to do is pull, pull the jib over. How long does this take for you to do that maneuver? Yeah, it takes longer time, of course. It's more complex and take longer times. But uh, in heavy weather, you always do a downwind, uh, you do a jibe, because you, you don't lost much uh, of, uh, of distance or to do a jibe out at the sea. So over 20 knots, we always do a jibe. But she, she comes about quite good. And we have tacking up again, uh, up in, in the rivers and things. And she makes, makes speed up against the, the current and, and, uh, and the wind. So it's, she is effective. And you, you, you can imagine when they're coming into a bay with this type of boat. They was described like birds complying. And, and they, the, the other, the other uh, they didn't have any comparing with this ship. And then you can sail right up on the shoreline or row it. So, so that was a uh, very, very complex uh, ship for that time, thousand years ago. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And um, so you're 115 feet wide, you're 26 foot beam, and about six feet of draft uh, yeah. is. And, and eight, uh, nine feet, because the rudder goes down a little bit further. That's right. Uh, and what I think was also amazing, and you were talking about the speed, that the clinker hull, where, where the, each one of the strakes overlaps, creates an air cushion that goes all the way under the hull, which makes yeah. you go faster. Yeah. yeah. It, we had a, a camera underneath, and you can see that on our video, how the bubbles just move all the time. It's covered with bubbles. So that's maybe one reason why she is so fast. And also she's extremely flexible. So you know when they say that she goes through the water like a snake, yeah. it's because she's very, very flexible. Yeah, she's scary and flexible. <laughs> you know, when you come on board the first time, you're used to ships who's decked and things like that. She flex, but she should flex. And uh, she, uh, when you get used to it, when, but when we get pilots and other people on board, I'm looking forward and see the, the dragon, uh, the bow doing like this. It's scaring for somebody. But uh, we have done uh, North Atlantic, and that's a tough challenge. So if she can stand that flexibly over uh, North Atlantic, then she's She's a safe ship. <laughs> um, talk, talk, uh, tell us a little bit about um, how sensitive she is in the rudder, because it's funny, right? Port and starboard. Starboard was because of steer board, which was what you guys have, which is a board that's about goes about nine feet underwater and has a little tiller on it. Uh, I thought it was great that Morton Tiller, Norway's acquisition chief, was here, and there was a human tiller and a real tiller that we were looking at uh, over, but they were both real tillers. But, and port was the side that you approached on generally because it was the port side and didn't have the, the steer board there. How, how does she respond to the helm? How responsive is she when you, when you move the rudder? She is uh, very sensible. We ha she is balanced. And the um, mast is in the middle of the ship, and uh, if you drifting, she is not dipping by, with the bow like other ships. She just goes like this, and we adjust the trim so she she is balanced. But even so, you know you have the rudder on starboard side, and that will stop. Uh, will will have some restriction, so she will turn to to starboard, but. The Vikings was not stupid. They compensate for that. So they make the rudder uh, eccentral. So in one side is flat, and on, a, on the outside is a round curve on the outside of the rudder to lift the, the, the rudder. So she's balanced, and you can't believe it. In, in heavy weather, in heavy weather we are several steering, but normally in like in in 30 knots or, or things, she, one man can stand there and steer, and she's balanced and she responds very good. But she's a disaster when you should go into 
to a quayside, to, to bus. That's uh, the challenge. You have no propeller stream to the rudder and nothing. So um, I used to do like this. <laughs> <laughs> and and make sure that there are a lot of uh, fenders out yeah. to make sure that you know yeah. you have you have something to bump up against when you when you come in. Yeah. Now you guys have done so much traditional work that comes off of uh, the Osberg ship and a few yeah. of the other things. Talk to us about the extraordinary woodwork and some of the decorations um, and also some of the traditions. Right, you don't set the dragon until you leave no. home and uh, and then also talk to us about the crows also for example that are built onto the ship. Yeah, I should try to remember all your questions. <laughs> But but the, the ship is built in oak and uh, everything is uh, nailed and, and ribbed together, the whole style, with um, iron ribbons and uh, wooden ribbons and, and also uh, ship nails. And um, the dragon was to protect the ship and of course to frighten other ships, uh, other people and so on. So, they never put up the dragon head before they left the harbor. And we did the same. We was in the settlement of King Harald, the first king of Norway, uh, when we start the journey, and we put up the dragon head. And it works. The ship is still afloat, you know. <laughs> so, um, so it protects us good. And uh, then we have a lot of carving, and they was excellent craftsmen. So we have carvings over here, for instance, and we have carvings on the tiller. We have carvings everywhere, and we e even saw uh, somebody, some type of graffiti from a thousand years ago. They have a footstep, and I'm going to show you that on on the planking for 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 the deck, or it's not a real deck, but the planking here. Right. Yeah. And, and, and what do the two crows uh, signify that's back at the helm station? Yeah, it was before the Christian time, the, the ass, I believe, and that was Odin's two crows. And the uh, ravens, I mean, right. it's not crows, it's right. ravens. And, and um, the, he offered his only one eye to, uh, to get this... Um, two ravens and they go out in the world and tell the stories that was before the satellites you know <laughs> so uh, so the cross was was um, give him whisper what's happened in the world and give him his wisdom according to the religion there was, uh, intel as you said, there, his intelligence and reconnaissance systems were the two crows that were going around the world. Yeah. It, was a, it was a pretty good trade-off, actually, if you're a god, to make sure that you're, you're, you're keeping an eye on everything. Yeah. Uh, no, no pun intended. Um, so what's, what's next for you guys? You've been here in the United States, I think, since June. Uh, what's next? When do you guys uh, go home? Yeah, we, we are planning to stay here in the States. We, we think it's nice. But... <laughs> Uh, we're gonna go to New York next, and from New York we go up to Mystic Seaport uh, in uh, Connecticut. A very nice, uh, very very nice uh, museum, and we stay there for winter. And next year we're gonna do some crazy things, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe Northwest Passage. Um, but uh, you don't have to say that to anybody because it's a <laughs> secret. But maybe if we can raise money, we're going to go up in Northwest Passage. Um, that, would be, uh, that would be extraordinary. Let me ask you uh, one other question, which is, um, you know, when you were in the North Atlantic, some of those videos show you guys coming perilously close to icebergs uh, when you were, were making the passage. What's the biggest challenge in navigating that? And how damage resistant are you, for example, if you do bump into something? I mean, there are cargo containers that are out there that are hovering just below the surface. I mean, if, you know, several friends of mine who've been long distance sailors have always worried about that on a smaller ship. Um, you know, what are, what are the unique challenges? You know, how do you post lookouts? I mean, how do you get that visibility? Because even if you have radar, you're not gonna see something that's just under the surface of the water and you don't have a lot of watertight integrity in the event that you hit something. No, that, that's true. The, the difference between many other uh, small sailboats and things like that, we have lookouts all the time. With a radio and report to me or, or the guy in watch and um, 
we was not worried about the iceberg. Then we saw, we saw also the temperature drops on, on the water temperature. But the growlers, they are like this much above the surface and seven times more underneath. And if you are hit by one of them, it can damage the rudder or damage the hull. Uh, so we was very aware of that. So sometimes we even to grief in the night time to reduce the speed. So it was a little bit scaring to sail in high speed uh, in, if, with a lot of, of uh, ice floating around. And the, the worst thing is that you can't see the difference between the ice, the growlers, and the breaking waves, uh, both uh, white in the night. So it was very, very quick maneuvers, I can tell you sometimes when it comes close. And, and how quickly can she turn, right? You said that she's very balanced, but in the event that you have to make an emergency maneuver, how responsive is she when she turns? She is responsible, but of course the, the, she's 150 feet, foot, uh, foot, so it takes a time. But, but still, she is m much more maneuverable than, and than other tour ships I have been on. Um, the last question. Are you going to try to do this dressed in period clothing? Because I know occasionally you dress up as King Harold, uh, you know, kind of to make a point. Uh, but the whole crew here, yeah, you're not dressed in, the, in your full uh, royal rig, uh, sir. Uh, but you know, you guys wear very modern uh, equipment. You have uh, emergency position locators that are on everybody's coats and flotation vests and everything else. I mean, they're full immersion suits when you guys are on deck, especially in, in rough weather. But how would Vikings have done it? What kind of clothing would they have been wearing for a voyage like this? Because they were as exposed as you are um, and actually without any of the navigation systems you have. So they were judging weather and storms and everything by eye and by experience. Um, you know, what would they have been wearing for, for these journeys? And what would they have been eating for these journeys uh, coming, coming across uh, on long voyages? You know, that was probably a lot tougher than we was. And they didn't have any authorities looking down to them. So they did what they, they have to do, you know. And they were sleeping out on deck. They have deck chest, probably with some some uh, personal things, and they they try to hide as much as possible. But they properly properly suffered a lot out there, and they had guts to go out there uh, without knowing what's behind the horizon. So they had guts, and eating I probably salted and dried food and water and. Uh, Mewed. <laughs> it's good for them. <laughs> Sir, uh, Bjorn, you're one of the most experienced sailing captains uh, in the world, rigging master on the Gothenburg, uh, which is uh, Sweden's tall ship and has made some extraordinary journeys, including to China. Uh, you've been in a lot of storms at sea on, on square riggers, but you guys were not very long into your first voyage or an early voyage, and you guys got into a terrible storm north of Scotland. You were dismasted, uh, the mast broke. Tell us about that night, how terrifying it was, and how you guys managed to get back to safety. Yeah, it's terrifying. And uh, that was the test trail, actually. We, we was trying to, that was the first sea, uh, uh, ocean going North Sea in uh, 2014. And we was beating us up nearly to Orkney. And uh, in the night, we had to take more reefs and uh, we, we hoist the yard again and, and continue. And the weather was not good, I can tell you. And in the morning, it was light. Uh, suddenly, the moss was broken in the middle. One part jump windward, and the other jump over on, star on, on leeward side. And the yard went one and a half ton, come sailing down with the sail and, and uh, hit the rail. And uh, we always, we are trained, so we always do a muster and we counted the crew directly and one was missing. And that was quite a tough uh, time for me. And uh, then we start to search and we find a guy under the yard, under the sail, in the only, probably the only safe place on board the ship, the head. He was sitting down in the head, and we were so lucky when we find him there. 
and then we we start the hard work to get uh, to rid up in the mess on board with the sail and the yard and the shouts and the moss hanging there and we went back to Orkney uh, to uh, Shetland Islands and from Shetland Islands we went over to Scotland cut down a huge tree and in 14 days 14 days later we were sailing again and that tree you can see behind you there uh, so um, we did it by itself. We, we turned it disaster to something uh, positive. And that's probably what the Vikings should have. You, sh you need some spirit now when you are out there. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an amazing story, and I can only imagine how terrifying it is because you guys have one sail and you have one mast and you know very small engines, which are sort of. Get, and you used engines to get to Shetland. Yes, we, we had to go with the wind and with the uh, waves because the engines, we are not possible to go, go uh, towards heavy weather like that. And um, we also have a very short range for the, for the motors, but we are required to have them. And sometimes it's good, like in occasions like this. So we was able to go back by ourselves and, uh, and um, no one was hurt. That was the most important. You know, you're, you're trying to be as accurate as you can with the ship. I know that for a while you guys were sailing with a silk sail, which just looks absolutely magnificent. Um, but one of the things that we talked about was all the myths that exist about Viking. Yeah. You know, that they rode these ships and they weren't very good sea ships, for example, or that the sails were made out of wool. You know, in, you know I know that you're not a historian or an archaeologist, right? But, um, you know, what are all the myths about Vikings? Because the more you learn about them, you realize so much of it was wrong and that actually it was a far more civilized and sophisticated society than people give them credit for. Yeah. One thing we, we find out was the historian has been wrong many times. It's, it's not possible. And they, they thought the main source was ruining. It's impossible to rule a hundred ton ship a long time, but it's possible to go into harbors and, and shorter periods. But the main source is a sail, and it has to be a real good sail clause. We know it because we have ruined a lot of sails, so we know it. And so if they say that the sail clause were made of wool, they don't know anything about sailing. So in that way, we could uh, see what's working or what not working, and uh, that's good for me. And I know the Vikings was excellent craftsmen. They was not stupid. They make excellent ships. They had learned to make good iron. And, uh, and uh, they could do jewelry. They could make good clo clothing uh, dresses and things like that. And they was excellent. And uh, why should they on the ship? put on stupid things. It's not make sense. And uh, um, it was an incredible trading empire, right? I mean, if you look at the reach of the, what the Viking Empire was like, it was extraordinary. Yeah, it was. They ruined the, the Europe at that time. There was the British Islands, Ireland, Isle of Man, Scotland, Orkney, France. There was down in Mediterranean. There was the Black Sea. And they had a a very very broad uh, 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 influence and and you know they they also uh, the the main person was not uh, was not raids and coming in and kill people it was trade they 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 trade uh, with all these countries and uh, they do it year by year coming back and forth and establish in in some place for four, three, four hundred years. And so they couldn't be that bad. It's only we who are <laughs> some bad. <laughs> yeah. Captain Björg Allander, uh, captain of the Drakken Harald Hor Fogre.
Thanks very much, sir. It was such an honor uh, spending time with you. I mean, it's been a childhood dream of mine to actually be on a Viking longship uh, as a kid who just thought that these were some of the coolest ships in history uh, and, and just uh, the history of it and, and everything else. Thanks very much. We look forward to seeing you guys in Connecticut uh, at some point before you head back home. And if you ever need a deckhand on the, your Northwest Passage, uh, I'm a pretty hardy and a pretty decent helmsman, so I'm happy to help. You can sign on today. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. I just want to tell my family and everybody who watches this, I'm going to take a vacation and go into the uh, high north. Sir, thanks very much and best of luck on the rest of the tour until we see you again. Thank you. We need it. <laughs> yeah.